with the English Revised Version, we've looked at its origin, we've looked at the Old Testament translators, and those who worked on the committee which did the New Testament. What we come to next are the guidelines that were proposed, as with any communal or group work to be done, the guidelines that were proposed for the men to follow. Now these are not the same as the earlier five resolutions that were submitted by the lower house of convocation. But as the KJV translators had their 15 principles or guidelines to work by, so the ERV translators had theirs. However, they were only half in number. We have eight principles or guidelines that were to be followed by the translators of the English Revised Version, ERV. In our study now, we're only going to look at four of these, just going to brush past the first three and spend most of our time on the fourth one. Here's the first one. First principle or guideline to show you what they were after in their work in translating the English Revised Version. To introduce as few alterations, so we see it right off the bat it's going to be a work done conservatively, as possible into the text of the authorized version consistently with faithfulness. To introduce as few alterations as possible. That's really all you need. This is going to be a conservative work, as few alterations in the text as possible. The AV, do it consistently with faithfulness. Now if we have time later on, not in this message, but next week or so, we may take time to look at five different types of alterations that were allowed because this guideline reads to introduce as few alterations as possible into the text of the AV. But in any case, note that this is a very conservative guideline. In any case, notice that they are guarding against any notion of this being a new translation. It is to be exactly what its name says, an RV, a revised version. See, that's a good name for it because that's exactly the principle behind their first guideline. The second guideline, to limit as far as possible the expression of such alterations, the alterations of principle one, to the language of the authorized and earlier English versions. So now the emphasis of guideline two is on the language. Keep the poetry, keep the, for the most part, the antiquated phrases because they are so ingrained in people's memory now. So number one was introduce as few alterations. Number two, to limit as far as possible the expression of such alterations to the language of the authorized and earlier English versions. And this, of course, would have then caused criticism of this translation by others who said, well, then why do anything at all? I mean, if you're going to be so conservative as to make as few alterations as possible, and when you make them, make them in KJV language, well, then why even translate? You're not really doing anything or giving us anything. Well, that criticism is maybe only 20% valid, as the fourth guideline will show you. The third guideline read, each company to go twice over. That's the important point. The portion to be revised once provisionally, the second time finally, and on principles of voting as herein after is provided. In other words, go over the work twice each company to go twice over the portion to be revised, once provisionally, the second time finally, and on principles of voting as hereinafter is provided. You may can tell that I'm not even intending to give you time to get all of that down word for word. Okay, now we come to what we want to come to, and that's the fourth guideline. Those three are, you pretty much haven't said anything, as I said, and that's why some have criticized. Uh, right after its publication, uh, the ERV, because you didn't do anything. You tried to keep everything in line with the KJV. Well, that's not totally correct, because here is the fourth principle. 
that the text, there's the important word, T-E-X-T, that the text to be adopted be that for which the evidence is decidedly preponderating. In other words, copious, most abundant, most plentiful. And that when the text so adopted differs from that from which the authorized version was made, the alteration be indicated in the margin. Now, I'll read that again, and then we'll explain it. That the text to be adopted be that for which the evidence is decidedly preponderating. And that when the text so adopted differs from that from which the AV was made, then the alteration is to be indicated in the margin. So, in other words, we have the KJV and the text that lies behind it. And so now we've got the ERV, and they're saying we're going to only use the text for which the evidence is most decided. And if they think that it's different than the text of the KJV, then they're going to use a different text and then note over here in the margin um, the evidence and the alteration, why the alteration has been made. Okay, here at this point we have the heart of the purpose behind the ERV, behind its being translated. Why translate it if you're going to stay as close to the KJV as possible? Well, only as close in language and so forth. Make as few alterations as, as necessary, as possible. But if the text behind the KJV is thought to be by the translators of the ERV deficient, such as late in history, then a change is going to have to be made. And that's the whole basis for the English Revised Version. Tie together what I said years ago in textual criticism about the increase of knowledge, textual knowledge and studies that have been done, with what I've said just recently of what has happened in the period between the KJV and the ERV. And by the way, the information is the same, and you'll see what I mean. That the great men like Tischendorf and Tregellis and Westcott and Hort and the textual theories and the new manuscripts and so forth that have come to light have blown to pieces the time-honored textus receptus. And it is now time for a change. Of course, not everyone agrees that it's time for a change, but nonetheless it is, and a change has come with the translation of the ERV. Now let's break this up now into two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. This fourth guideline is the whole point for the ERV. They've got a better text, they feel. I mean, whether they're right or wrong, that's what they feel, that they have a better text, and so they want to do something about it, that is, make a new translation. They don't have the problems you see then, in 1881, that uh, modern translations have had in this century with antiquated language of the KJV. That wasn't an issue to them. Uh, the beauty of the language, they are willing to bow before, admit, and confess. Today, you see, um, we already have translations which have been done and done and done on the basis of what people believe to be better text, but today people keep wanting to take the language of the ancient versions away and put it in the vernacular of the people. That was not the aim or the goal behind the ERV. Um, that change hadn't come in social thought, I guess we could say. They were at home with the cadences and the the terminology, the idiom of the KJV. But the text, that's another matter. So the Old Testament, we'll start with that. Now, what was the new text behind the Old Testament in the ERV? What was the new text behind? I mean, they're looking for a better text. What was the new text behind the Old Testament of the ERV? There was no new text. That was hard. The Dead Sea Scrolls are 80 years away, their discovery, 80 years away. All they have is the Masoretic text. Nothing has changed. No new discoveries concerning the Old Testament. Remember, most of these manuscripts that we keep talking about are manuscripts of the New Testament, not the Old. The Old had been the Masoretic text, 
which had been standardized 8th, 9th, 10th century A.D., and which hadn't changed and didn't change until the recent discovery in this day and age of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then it only changed slightly. What really the Dead Sea Scrolls proved, after all, after a long period of time, was the fact that the Masoretic text was reliable after all, although it was a thousand plus years after the actual writing of the Old Testament. So in other words, what we're saying here is the Old Testament in the ERV is not important at all. If you don't have any new text, you don't have anything to change then. The text possessed by the ERV men, the Masoretic, is essentially the same. There were a few changes. We don't even need to go into those. Essentially the same as the 1611 men had, the translators of the KJV. Masoretic text was basically essentially the same. You say, well, what about some of the other versions that they could use, such as the Septuagint, Aquila, the Samaritan Pentateuch, some of these other things we've looked at. Well, I can say this about that. The ERV men were very conservative in making use of any of the ancient versions. And they were shown later to be pretty much correct in this path. The Masoretic text of the Hebrew Old Testament is basically the most reliable. You can get some help from the Septuagint, Aquila, Theodosian, Symmachus, Origins, Hexopla, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and so forth, but, but not a lot. Uh, people, I don't know why they'd want to spend time and years and money getting degrees to study all these things. It doesn't really change anything in the long run. The Masoretic text, that's an oversimplification, but in this church, we don't need any more than that or really need to know any more than that. But let's ask ourselves another question. So, so the text, there's, there's no textual difference. The text is pretty much the same. But that doesn't say everything. What advantage do the translators of the ERV have over the KJV men concerning the Old Testament? We've talked about this in recent times. No, nothing to do with the text. Okay, much better knowledge of the Semitic languages. You see, the Semitic languages weren't languages that were on the rise being studied in 1611. You've got much better knowledge of the Semitic languages. You've got much better knowledge of, of textual principles. I mean, you've got the Masoretic text, but the Masoretic text, I mean, that wasn't just like one book or something. You had different recensions of the Masoretic text. Which one are you going to take? You've got better textual knowledge, better linguistic knowledge, a much better knowledge of the Semitic languages, including Hebrew and its cognates, which would perhaps then help them, even if you've got the same Masoretic text and the same word, maybe you'll translate it a different way now. Um, maybe it's one of these so-called hopex legomena. It's, it's a word that appears only once in the Old Testament. And maybe the translators of the ERV, because they know more about Hebrew, their Hebrew scholarship is better, they'll choose to translate that differently. Although it's the same text behind their Old Testament as the KJV, they'll choose to translate it differently than did the men of 1611. And that does happen on occasion. Now, let's come to the New Testament. This, of course, is the important thing because this is where all the discovery has been. Here is where the problem exists. New manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, some manuscripts not far away from the autographs, like the papyri, although the papyri wasn't discovered quite yet. That really is right at the turn of the century, but we end up with, as you know, a papyrus fragment of John's Gospel that appears today from around 125 A.D., that's not very far removed from the autograph itself, 125 A.D., compared to some Byzantine manuscript of 1100 or 1200 or 1300 A.D. You've got tremendous increase and tremendous advantage now over the men of the KJV. Assuming, of course, you believe that uh, this isn't the work of the devil who has given you all of these older manuscripts to get you to change around the text of the New Testament. Some people felt that that was the work of the devil because a lot of people hate to give up history. I mean, we, we've done it this way all along. This has been the text all along is the Byzantine Textus Receptus and they hate to surrender history. 
I think some people even felt that maybe just as God had written with his own finger and given the Ten Commandments to Moses, that the devil wrote these manuscripts with his own finger and hid them in places like St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai, the foot of Mount Sinai to be more precise. But that's going to the extreme, I think, of superstition in explaining this. Okay, we've got people like Tregellis. Remember, he was one of the people on the New Testament committee who is one of the luminaries, along with Tischendorf and Westcott and Horde, of the mid to late uh, 19th century, who has done so much discovering as well as translating and textual work. However, Tregellis is ill at this time, and so he worked little, if any, on the ERV. He died in 1875, and the work does not come out until the next decade, the 1880s. Of course, we still have um, Hort to deal with, and we're still looking for Westcott, but here's Tregellis, right along with Westcott and Hort. That is, they believe the same textually. Their textual theories are aligned, but Tregellis is ill. He works very little, if any. I haven't been able to determine one way or the other whether he actually had a hand in the work, but if he did, it was a small hand, a small role, role that he played uh, because he died in 1875. The other important textual critic that we have, well-known one that we discussed some time ago, is Scrivener, along with, of course, W.H., Westcott and Hort. We've got them. Well, we've got another man, Scrivener. Well, maybe I should start with Westcott and Hort. Um, this is something that's very interesting to note. Westcott and Hort, um, who are working on Bible translations. I won't tell you where Westcott is right now. We'll find where he's been hiding later on. But Hort is working on the ERV. Westcott is not working on the ERV. He's working on something else. But Westcott and Hort, who are working on English Bible translations, are simultaneously busy at work on their Greek New Testament, which was published five days before the publication of the ERV's New Testament. See, we've got this going on at the same time. Westcott and Hort are probably the two best-known names as far as textual criticism is concerned in the 1800s. And they are involved in English work. Let's just say, for to simplify the matter, that both of them are involved in the ERV, although Westcott isn't. At the same time, simultaneously, they're busy at work on their Greek New Testament, written in Greek. Of course, you go back to the manuscripts and you pick out what you think to be the better variants following their so-called neutral uh, textual family, which has been blown to pieces, that theory, since then. But they were on the right track. There's really not any such thing as what Westcott and Hort felt. But they were on the right track. By the way, I just noticed this, that next year, 1988, uh, Hendrickson Publishers in Boston has slated the publication of one of the two volumes that Westcott and Hort did. They did two volumes in 1881, one, their Greek New Testament, just a Greek Bible, and two, um, a volume that gave an introduction to it, <clears throat> why they chose the variants that they did. In other words, the whole elaboration of Westcott and Hort's textual theories. And that's been out of print for a hundred years. And that's slated to come back in print by Hendrickson publishers. I don't have a copy because it's not ready yet, but I hope to get one. The second, not their Greek Bible because it wouldn't be of much value today. We've got better Greek Bibles around. But their other volume that gives the introduction and all of the reasons why they believe the way that they do. So, anyway, that brings Westcott and Hort up to date. But they are working on the Greek New Testament at the same time. I said it was published five days before the ERV's New Testament. They make all of their work available to the New Testament committee members for the ERV. So in other words, Westcott and Hort, because they are kind of like the leading names, or Cambridge New Testament Greek scholars here, uh, well, really professors of divinity, but because they're kind of the leading names, then they have, I mean, their hand is seen very evidently in the English Revised Version. But the other man that I mentioned, Scribner, who also is on this committee, was a strong opponent of Westcott and Hort. We gave this to you last Sunday morning because he was such a strong proponent 
of the Textus Receptus. You see, most scholars are following Westcott and Horn at this time. They're new theories of different texts and so forth. Uh, Scribner was not following them. However, Scribner was constantly outvoted whenever it came down to voting time on which text to follow or how to translate. Scribner was always in favor of the TR and he's always being outvoted. Now, according to Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N, who wrote, uh, this has been in this century, a, a famous book on the history of the English Bible, the Greek text behind the ERV differed in 5,788 places when compared with the Greek text behind the KJV. So that's not exactly the same as saying the ERV differed in that many places, although you'll have that many and then some. But the Greek text behind the ERV differs in 5,788 places from the text behind the KJV. This is according to King, and I haven't counted them. I've got better things to do. With one-fourth of them causing material difference, what Kenyon calls material difference. He doesn't mean doctrinal difference, but, I mean, there's a substantial change. It isn't just um, uh, a plural versus singular form. There's a substantial change. 5,788 places of difference with one-fourth a quarter of them causing material difference. Now, as we've seen, anything that is taken from the text, as it appeared in the KJV, um, whenever you open the ERV, is supposed to be noted somehow, placed in the margin or some uh, notation made to let us know that it does differ because the Greek text they are using behind the ERV differs. And so, not surprisingly, we find um, uh, things like John 5, verses uh, 3b through 4, and the like in the margin. Long passages, such as John 7, 53 through John 8, 11, the passage on the woman caught in adultery, are either bracketed or, as Mark 16, 9 to 20 is, a marginal note points out their suspected spuriousness. Now, I think you'll remember those are probably three of the best-known problem passages there. Mark, the ending of Mark 16, the long versus the short ending, the woman caught in adultery, first few verses of John 8, and maybe the one that you don't remember as well because it's such a short passage is that one in John 5, verses 3b through 4, We've got a sick man for, what, 38 years, I believe, who has been beside this pool. And why is he there? Well, he's waiting for the moving of the water because an angel comes down from heaven to move the water. And the first one in after the moving of the water is healed. And so the earlier, many of the earlier manuscripts don't have this section from 3b through 4. Well, we have commented on these time and time again, and maybe I just need to say one more time to make sure we understand all of this, <clears throat> concerning Mark 16, John 8, John 5, the textual, the ancient textual evidence is not the best for these portions of Scripture. But nevertheless, most scholars still feel that they are so ancient that they may well go back to... Not only, I've even seen one say this early, not only the early church, but actually back to the men uh, to whom they are ascribed in the Textus Receptus. In other words, like, for instance, I was reading from another scholar's book on John 8, and uh, he was saying, he was giving the textual evidence, as we've looked at ourselves before, that um, textually it's suspect and, and what, what, what he means by that you see we don't have the manuscript that John wrote maybe John's had it in there this is the argument of some people who want to use you know the KJV and not have any problems with any of the passages maybe John had it in there and then maybe the problem is some of those early great uncial manuscripts for whatever reason lost the passage and so if we're basing everything on nothing but you know 4th century manuscripts um, who's to say you see, uh, the other side of the argument would be, well, you're basing 
things on, you know, 11th century A.D. manuscripts because you have to go late to find manuscripts, the Byzantine ones that do contain these passages. Well, is that any worse than basing everything on 4th century or 3rd century, really 4th century A.D. manuscripts that don't have these passages when maybe John did have this passage. Maybe Mark did have that passage. So they're hotly debated. So, see, I haven't taken them out of my Bible, but I'm saying we've got to... And you know what? I think I've said this before. There, there is nothing in any of those passages that is heretical or unorthodox in any sense of the term. They are in perfect agreement with what we know from Jesus or from the early church. And I think I made this comment on John 5 one time. That's why I have you over here. Read along with me, and I want to show you how it would appear as though the passage doesn't make sense if you leave out verses 3 and 4. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered. Then we, then we just skip to verse 5 because they tell us the rest of that's not supposed to be in there. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Now don't read on. Stop there for a moment. Why are all these sick people in these five colonnades here, these five porches? Why are they all there? See, this passage would give us no explanation for what caused so many sick people to be congregated at the same place. And then let's go on. When Jesus saw him lie and saw him lie and knew that uh, he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Well, it should be made whole. The impotent man said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. Now, verse 7 is not suspect in anyone's guidebook. Well, what do you mean water is troubled? If you leave out 3B through 4, we don't know what you're talking about because there's no troubling of the water in verses 1 through 3A. You have to read that passage that the earlier manuscripts don't have for the interpretation of verse 7 to be given to you. See, now let's go back and read what the modern versions take out. 3b, waiting for the moving of the water. Well, now help, that'll help us explain verse 7 then. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That would explain why all the sick folk are there. That would explain why the man talks about water and it's being troubled in verse 7. But if you follow the new versions like ERV and NIV, they'll all, I'm sure, have notes on this and it's not found in the ancient manuscripts. And you take that out, you're kind of pulling the rug out from underneath your own self because you're left with nothing, a void, a vacuum. And the same is true with, not, not, not that, not, not the same in the sense that you can't even interpret the passage, but, I mean, the same type of argument is used for John 8 as well as Mark 16, that there's nothing wrong in the passage. Um, the teaching in those passages is found more or less in other places of Scripture. The added, for instance, in Mark 16, no problem with the teaching there. That's found in other places. The commission reads similar to other commissions such as in uh, John 20 Acts 1 especially Acts 1 in Matthew 28 the attitude and the spirit of Jesus in John 8 verses 1 through 11 is as we know him to be in the Gospels and so anyway the passage however in 1st John 5 verse 7b through 8a heavenly witness passage what does the ERV do with this? It's totally left out. Not a note in the margin, not a bracket, not anything. That was against their own guidelines. They said if you leave something out, put a note of it, or put it in the margin. Well, we have John 5, 3, B through 4 in the margin. We've got a note of it there. Mark 16, a note. John 7 and 8, bracketed. 1 John 5, 7b through 8a, totally left out. Well, that's not a surprise because we know the history behind that. Um, Erasmus got into some problems challenging someone over that, and so someone went out and wrote a manuscript and stuck it in. 
And that's not found in any manuscripts for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not that we've got a difficulty of maybe some of the important ones leave it out, but the unimportant ones include it. Nobody includes John 5, 7b through 8a, the so-called three heavenly witness passage. So that would, I guess, be okay to leave it out. But, of course, whenever that happened, a great cry went up from the lay people who saw this because they feared that the translators, who, by the way, we've seen many of them were of a liberal persuasion, were trying to remove the doctrine of the Trinity from the Bible <laughs> because this was a famous proof text for the Trinity. But it's really not the best proof text for the Trinity, number one, because it's, it's suspect textually, number two, because it is rather mystical. The, the, the water and the spirit and the word and go to some passages like Matthew 3 where Jesus is being baptized and the Father's voice comes out of heaven this is my beloved son hear ye him and the spirit is descending in the bodily form of a dove or Acts 10.38 for another one if you want a good proof text for the Trinity those are very clear 1 John 5 7b through 8a even if we left it in is rather mystical and difficult to interpret um, there was one great notable opponent who opposed to the ERV, and that was John William Bergen, B-U-R-G-O-N. John William Bergen, Dean of Chichester, C-H-I-C-H, -H, Chichester, from 1876 to 1888. F.F. F. Bruce, in his book on English translations, describes Bergen as a prime example of a, I quote, defender of lost causes. The times had changed, and Bergen was not willing to admit that the voice of antiquity, all earlier Bible translation work, along with the voice of the majority of the manuscripts, which were, however, late, were simply wrong. He disliked Dean Bergen, Dean of Chichester, he disliked Westcott and Hort giving so much space to two codices, uh, 0, 1, all that, uh, 0, 3, B, or Sinaiticus, we know them by their name, and by Deconus. Of course, they gave a whole lot of weight to these two, but uh, I had it right the first time, to these two early fourth century uncial manuscripts, one which had just come to light and one which was just brought to light by the Vatican. So it, it wasn't as though Bergen disliked so much the ERV itself, but he despised the underlying text and the theories and work of Westcott and Hort. And I think his criticisms were more directed against their Greek Bible than Hort's hand in this English translation of the English Revised Version. Now let's just take a look at uh, three examples and we'll make your coming out for the service now this time worthwhile because you'll have some things to go home and think about with these verses. So turn over to Luke 23 verse 34. Maybe you didn't know that this is also one of those passages that has um, caused problems with people who study textual matters. By the way, while you're turning over there, here I have my own copy of the English Revised Version, New Testament, 1881. Uh, as you see, it's just a New Testament because that's the important thing. The old, you don't really have much of a change. And you see the name of it there is Revised Version. And I've already explained why I'm, why I'm calling it the ERV because it has a counterpart on the other side of the Atlantic, and secondly, we don't want to uh, confuse it, or I don't want you to have it confused in your mind with the RSV, which will come 1940s and 1950s. So let me hold on to this now, and then I may, I may pass it around. It's an old copy, obviously. It's over 100 years old, 1881, but this is the ERV New Testament. Okay, uh, Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Now let me read what 
Bergen had to say about this passage. These twelve precious words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Doctors Westcott and Hort enclose within double brackets in token of the moral certainty they entertain that the words are spurious. And yet these words are found in every known unshul and in every known cursive copy except four, besides being found in every ancient version. But that appears not to be true. It appears that they are absent from the earliest known forms of the old Latin, the Syriac, and the Coptic versions. And what, we ask the question with sincere simplicity, what amount of evidence is calculated to inspire undoubting confidence in any existing reading, if not such a concurrence of authorities as this? And he goes on to cite, he quotes some more that I won't take the time to read, and then he goes on to cite 40 passages from the writings of the fathers where similar words are referred to as part of the gospel text. Well, this is a, um, a textual problem right here. Um, Luke 23, 34. You often hear of sermons being preached on the seven sayings of Christ on the cross. You have to get all four gospel writers together in order to get all seven sayings. And yet some people have noted that we do have textual problems here. Well, that's what I want to look at briefly tonight to show you uh, again, how you go about looking at these matters and discussing these issues concerning this very important passage, uh, as Bergen calls it a very precious, beautiful passage, Jesus' prayer to the Father concerning his murderers, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, let me ask you this question. You probably won't be able to answer it. It's rather difficult. It doesn't take anything except thinking, though. You don't have to know anything else. But can you think of a reason why, if this passage was genuine, it might later have been dropped? I mean, that's one place where you have to start. You have to ask yourself, now, if it wasn't genuine, what caused it to be brought in here in the first place? If it was genuine, what caused it to be dropped later? You might not even be able to guess at this, but many people have noticed this. If they, you know, the average person doesn't even think. He would just read it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, I mean, someone who, who would have problems with it textually would then be asking himself, well, why do we have this here? They conscribed and got it because they thought it should parallel Stephen's passage and his murder. Okay, that's a good statement. That's off base, but that's, um, that's something that we could get into. Yes we would start definitely with a scribe might have added it uh, because of this or a scribe might have taken it away because of this. Um, well, I'll say more about Stephen here in a moment. But our question was, if it was genuine, what caused it to be dropped, not what caused it to be added? If it was genuine, what caused it to be dropped? No. Keep thinking. He's praying for his murderers. Father, forgive them. People have seen the similarity, to be sure, between Jesus' prayer and Stephen's prayer. And so the question has been asked, well, which one influenced the other? And to me it would seem a little difficult that this prayer would have been influenced by Stephen's prayer because you've got Jesus in as a servant of Stephen. And I don't think a scribe would go that far. No. It's got something to do with history later on. He's praying for his... Okay, let me be a little more specific. He's praying to the Father that he'll forgive his murders. Were they forgiven? Well, what does history show us? What about 40 years later, the fall of Jerusalem? Perhaps people of the early next century looked at this situation as follows. Here, Jesus prays that the Jewish nation and its religious leadership will be forgiven such a horrible crime as the murder of the Son of God. Yet, 40 years later, God sends the Romans in to inflict a horrible punishment on the Jews by sacking the city, killing tens of thousands of Jews, and scattering the rest. Thus, if the alleged prayer wasn't answered, it must mean Jesus didn't pray it because his prayers always got answers. 
So they're so they're saying, see, now now we know, you know, why this was later dropped, because a scribe second century, maybe early second century, looked at this, then looked at history as he knew it. This prayer wasn't answered. The Jews were not forgiven. On the contrary, they were almost wiped off the earth. But you see, we're still stuck, though, because all of this has been explaining how it got dropped if it was genuine. We still have to deal with its genuineness, though. That would only explain that it is. That would only inform us. That would, that would be a proof that it is a genuine passage and then it was later dropped in many manuscripts. Some important manuscripts, such as this one, 03b, Vaticanus, some important manuscripts do not have it. But you see, if all of this is true, it's difficult to imagine how the prayer ever got in in the first place. You see, I'm going to show you how counterproductive this reasoning is. If the passage shouldn't be there, and the reason that we know if it should, it was dropped because history didn't seem to bear it out, then how would it have gotten in in the first place? Because if, it's, if it was not penned by Luke, then some scribe in a later century stuck that in there. We have to ask the question, why would he stick it in there? Wouldn't he look at history and see that the prayer that he was putting on the lips of Jesus was impossible to place there because it wasn't a prayer that got an answer? So here's another way we can deal with this whole situation. And we can challenge the initial part of the assumption that the subjects of Jesus' prayer were the Jews and the Jewish leaders. Some people tell us this. The context is a Roman context with the Roman soldiers. Watch verse 33 through 34. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors one on the right hand and the other on the left and Jesus said Father forgive them because they don't know what they do and they parted his raiment and cast lots who would the they's be talking about but the Romans so that's one argument in favor of the fact it could have been a legitimate part of Luke and it was dropped because of misunderstanding. People later thought that he was praying a prayer of forgiveness for the Jewish people and it wasn't answered when in fact he wasn't asking for the forgiveness of the Jewish people but of the Roman soldiers. Others later just misinterpret this and thought that he meant Jews. But I would, I would say here, in either case, the argument is still in favor of genuineness. We still haven't gotten away from that. Westcott and Hort, as Bergen said, double-bracketed it. See, Westcott and Hort weren't always right in what they said or did. But in either case, whether he was praying for Romans or whether he was praying for Jews, you're still, what you're doing is you're arguing, although they don't realize it, you're arguing for the genuineness of the passage. Later it was dropped, some people would argue, because the Jews misunder or because the scribes misunderstood and thought he was talking about Jews. Well, let's say that he was talking about Jews or that he wasn't talking about Jews. You still are arguing for its genuineness. Others say, no, he couldn't be praying for the forgiveness of the Romans because they haven't done anything wrong. Um, in other words, they are only carrying out orders here. They are not the ones personally guilty. They didn't have the venom in their blood. Remember, Pilate tries three times to let Jesus off or to get him off. And so he's not praying for the Roman soldiers who are only doing their duty, but for the Jewish people who are responsible for it. Well, here would be my response. This is a difficult issue, but here would be my response. Westcott and Hort, the UBS, which is the standard Greek Bible that's used today, TDNT, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, all these major works are against this verse as being original. Westcott and Hort are against it, as we've seen. The modern Greek Bibles are against it. Some of you own a UBS or a Nestle Greek text. 
They are against it, being original. The Kittle's big 10-volume work, TDNT, is against it as being original. The New Evangelical Expositor's Bible Commentary, abbreviated EBC, I wouldn't say is against it, but certainly is not for it. I think the author starts off the textual discussion of it with the word with the words may not. These words may not, I'm sure that's what he said, may not have been part of Luke's original gospel. In other words, he's inclined to be against that. My response is I think they were a part of Luke's gospel. And here are my reasons why. And there's so much more we could say about this, but we'll just come down on the positive side and give you a couple of reasons at this time. Number one, we do have early manuscript support for it. Sinaiticus does contain it. Vaticanus doesn't. Number two, and here's really the crucial argument right here. Number two, if it's genuine, we do have logical ways to explain why it might have been later dropped the sack of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. If it is genuine, we do have logical ways to explain why it was later dropped. If it's spurious, no device comes to my mind to demonstrate how it was first included. But I haven't seen anyone else suggest if it is spurious, how did this ever enter the text? Because, you see, it would appear as though history would be against that prayer. So if he didn't pray it, why would a scribe want to invent that 300 years later and put it in? If it is genuine, we do have reasons to explain why it was dropped. If it is not genuine, no device comes to my mind to demonstrate why it was first included, or why at this point. Because the evidence of history might seem to be against that. Number three... Acts 7.60 is very similar. Lord, lay not this to their charge. Stephen's prayer. Acts 7.60 is very similar, but I think it's best to see Stephen's prayer pattern on Jesus rather than the reverse. If Jesus truly prayed this prayer, and I believe that he did, I don't think there are, any, there are any good logical reasons to say that he didn't. If he did pray this prayer, it would only follow suit that his disciples afterwards could be found praying this prayer whenever they were receiving ill treatment at the hands of their enemies. But you see, let's just assume that it was not original. Well, we know we don't have any problem with Stephen's prayer. Father, forgive them. Don't lay this sin to their charge. Well, then... Are we going to imagine a scribe would have gone back and then put Stephen's words on the lips of Jesus? That wouldn't make any sense then. Because you, he would already know that the earlier centuries knew that that wasn't part of what Jesus said. Then you're making Jesus a servant of Stephen. You're making his prayer patterned on Stephen's prayer instead of Stephen's prayer patterned on Jesus' prayer. And number four. As I see it, the important matter is determining the subject of the prayer. For whom did Jesus pray? Jews or Romans? As I see it, the important matter is to determine who the subject of the prayer is. Now, of course, as we've already said, many argue Romans because of this phrase, they know not what they do. These people argue the Gospels make plain the fact that the religious leaders crucified Jesus with open eyes in the sense that they had seen the miracles, they had heard the teaching, um, they didn't really have anything to do about that except get rid of the man. So in other words, this prayer wouldn't, because it couldn't, apply to them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do because the Jews knew what they were doing. They went against all the light that they had seen in crucifying Jesus. But for a Roman soldier who maybe had just been brought down from Caesarea along with um, the prefect or procurator, Pontius Pilate, they might not have been privy to the 
um, charges and this information against Jesus. And so they, they're cruel, pagan people, and they, and they treat Jesus very cruelly, but they really don't know what they're doing. They haven't had time to see his life and hear his teaching and watch the miracles that the Jews have. So that would kind of be the arguments in favor of the subjects being the Romans of Jesus' prayer. But then I think you could come down very strongly on the other side of the issue and say, no, the subjects of Jesus' prayer are his people, the Jewish people. That's the context of Stephen's prayer, by the way. Who kills him? The Jews, the religious leaders. The same Sanhedrin that put Jesus to death. And in one sense, the Jews didn't know what they were doing. In one sense, they did. I mean, they did it with their eyes open. They couldn't resist this man with his wisdom and with his miracles. But in another sense, if you, if you knew with your heart of hearts that this is God in the flesh, no person in their right mind would kill him. So I'd say in one sense, the Jews didn't know what they're doing. In other words, they could fit this description for they know not what they do. One sense the Jews didn't know. Remember whenever Jesus prayed over Jerusalem, I think we've got a, a statement that's uh, similar to what I need here in um, well, I'm looking in Matthew 23. I'm not finding it here. Uh, no, 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 no. Maybe, maybe that's Well, it's, it must be in a parallel passage where Jesus said, you know, if, if you knew that what had been brought unto you, you know what I'm thinking of, maybe if someone can help me with the passage, then you, you wouldn't have done this. It must be a parallel to Matthew. What's the parallel? Uh, Luke 11. See if it's in Luke 11. That's not what I'm looking for. It's there somewhere. If you would have known, you know, the, um, the, the peace that was yours, then you wouldn't have done these things. I can't think of where the passage is right now. But anyway, it doesn't matter. You, you know that that's there. In other words, what he's saying is, if you had known, you know, who I am, you wouldn't be doing this. You would have received me. You would have said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The point being, they didn't know what they were doing. And I think Luke has this motif of blindness right here in the uh, Passion narrative, such as in chapter 24 and verse 16. I think he has it, what, three times here? Uh, 24, 16, and verses 31 and 37. A motif of blindness, of people who knew but then they didn't know. He appears to two men on the way to, or two disciples on the way to Emmaus. Now they knew who he was, they were his disciples. But we read their eyes were holden so that they didn't know. And then those two come to the place where the other disciples are gathered. And they all sit down to eat. And they all knew who Jesus was. They could recognize him, but they didn't recognize him until he said uh, grace over the meal. And then their eyes were opened and he vanished from their sight. And then he appears again in verse 37, but they are terrified and affrighted and suppose they had seen a spirit. I think Luke is dwelling on a motif of knowing but not knowing, a motif of blindness. And I think that could apply to Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Jews know what they, they are doing, but in a sense, they don't know what they're doing. Then we have to answer the problem, how to explain the fact that the prayer wasn't answered. That seems to have caused the problems in the first place in a lot of people's minds. So how do we explain the prayer not being answered? Well, we don't explain the prayer not being answered because it was answered. These people think of it like this. I mean, just because the Romans come 40 years later and destroy the temple and the city and kill tens of thousands of Jews doesn't mean that Jesus' prayer at this time was an answer. These people and their leaders deserved to be immediately vaporized, annihilated for murdering God's son. In other words, what I'm saying is I feel nothing short of a personal prayer 
of the Lord himself could protect these people from the wrath of Almighty God. They are putting to death God's own Son. They deserve to be vaporized on the spot for that. The religious leaders and the people who are crying, crucify him, crucify him. I think that is what we need to understand. I don't think that he's really praying. Well, let me say it another way. Um, well, I don't know whether I, I've got the uh, wherewithal to say it the other way. I'd like to say, well, maybe he's, maybe we could solve this issue by grabbing both horns of the dilemma and say, well, he was praying for all the people involved, the Jews and the Romans. That, that may be true, but I don't know that I have any basis to say that on. I think that what we have here is Jesus' prayer for the Jewish people and for their leaders. I don't think the Romans are too involved in it. They are the ones who really don't know what's going on. They don't even need a prayer for forgiveness because uh, it's not going to help them one way or the other. They're not responsible, in other words. Who is responsible for the death of the Son of God? The Jewish leaders, not Pontius Pilate and not the Roman centurions. I think the, the end of the four Gospels make that very clear. Pontius Pilate over and over again tries to release Jesus. The Gospel writers are trying to make it clear Pilate and the Romans are not responsible for his murder. I mean, in one sense they are. But in the final sense, the Jewish people with their blindness and their hard heart, they are the ones responsible. And think, this isn't a, a mere man. This isn't like your son. This is the son of Almighty God. And these religious leaders are murdering him. God could easily, he probably would have, have smitten them to death on the spot whenever they hung Jesus on the cross. That's the awesomeness of it all. But it took a special prayer of his. And God, so, so God answered the prayer. God, In other words, God didn't forgive them in the sense that I won't lay the sin to their charge. We've talked about forgiveness before. Remember, forgiveness, in order to forgive, you have to have two people involved here. And these guys aren't repenting at all. What he means by forgive them is give them space to repent so you can forgive. And so what does God do? He gives them four more decades. 40 years, which is kind of like the same as the wandering in the wilderness period. 40 days, 40 uh, years to repent, and they don't repent. And so God does send in the Roman armies, which just annihilates the city then. That, I think, is what we have behind the prayer. Now, I'm not a total authority on this, so if I have to modify it or something later on, then uh, I hope you'll allow me. But that's what I see from it right now, with just a quick study of the passage. And he's praying for the Jewish people who really, truly don't know what they're doing. They are just like um, uh, sheep that are blind uh, following wolves who are their leaders. And so it takes a direct prayer, specific prayer of Jesus in order to spare them from annihilation. Okay, I'd wanted to look at Mark 16. I don't really have time to do that. Let's just... Uh, close out our time now by looking at one passage we've teased you with before and that's Romans 9 and verse 5. Romans 9 5 because this does become an issue in the ERV. Romans 9 5 similar to the one over in Titus uh, chapter 2 do we have good New Testament passages that ascribe the entity to Christ? Not by calling him Lord because Lord was also a term that you could call your husband or your master but God G-O-D. And so in the KJV, here's what we have. Romans 9, 5. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, Christ is the antecedent of this phrase, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. God blessed forever. And the cult people will give you problems with this passage right here. And it is ambiguous, to say the least, as it's translated in the KJV. We need before this Christ. X is in Greek, would stand for Christ. Christ, who is God-blessed forever. Christ, who is God-blessed. Well, what are we saying? Are we saying this? Christ, who is God-blessed. But he's blessed of God. 
Christ, God blessed forever. Well, you could say that of yourself, Joe Smith, God blessed. That doesn't prove deity for you, though, does it? It just says you're blessed of God. That's one way you can interpret that, that he's God blessed by putting a hyphen between the two words. It all depends on punctuation, and the Greek manuscripts don't have their punctuation. Or do we need a comma? Now watch how that changes the whole meaning. Christ, who is God, and he's blessed forever. You've got two entirely different meanings now. One time you just called him Christ, and God blessed him. The other time you called him the one who is God. And because of that, he is blessed forevermore. So is it God blessed forever with the hyphen, so we've got Christ is blessed of God. Is it as the NIV has, Christ, comma, who is God over all, comma, forever praised, where deity is ascribed to him, or if you want that in the KJV, just put a comma, and you'll do the same thing the NIV has. Or is it the third marginal reading of the ERV, which reads, God be blessed forever, which I would call an independent doxology. In other words, you've got a lot of talking about Christ, and you end that, and you say, well, God be blessed forever. It's an independent doxology that has nothing to do or say about the subject of the verse, Jesus Christ. They stuck this in, Hort and the other translators, as the third marginal re reading on this passage. You've got the reading in the text of Romans 9, 5. You've got marginal reading number 1, number 2, and number 3. And Dean Bergen, who was the one so opposed to them, called this a Sicinian gloss gratuitously thrust into the margin of every Englishman's New Testament. He was very much opposed to it. Well, a lot of people think since we don't have punctuation in the early est manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, and there's no way you can really decide. I think there is, but it is a highly complex issue. But this is the way that you should have it. It is not an independent doxology. It is not simply saying that Christ is blessed of God. It is a passage in Romans 9 that ascribes very specifically deity to Jesus Christ. The NIV does it in a different way by rearranging the order. The KJV, you can leave yours the same way as long as you put a comma between God and blessed and not a hyphen. You kind of read it hyphenated, God blessed forever. No, God, pause, blessed forever. 